Uh, good day. This is uh, Portsmouth this, uh, this week, and I'm Jeffrey Shard, host for today's program. For those of you who are new to, uh, to the program, uh, when our new town administrator, John Klim, came to us, uh, he had an idea that uh, he'd like to put the town on camera uh, with a routine so that uh, we would get to know everybody in town. So he's gradually been working through this. So if you, if you want to see some of the prior shows, you can go to our town website and, uh, and double click on these things and you can see the variety of subjects we've, we've dealt with so far. Uh, today we're going to deal with um, the Harbor Master. And with me today for the program uh, is our Harbor Master, Detective Stephen Burns. Welcome, Steve. And he's backed up here by the Chief. Chief, uh, Chief Lance Siebert is here also. Um, the, the fact that the Harbor Master's function uh, is in our police department is somewhat unique on the island, and maybe we'll talk about that. But uh, um, it is, in fact, something that uh, an officer from our police department does in the summer. And that officer then goes back to uh, routine police work, if anything is routine in police work, um, for the regular, for the rest of the year. So I'm going to start with Steve, if, if I might. Um, what are the duties and responsibilities of the Harbor Master? Uh, primarily the town sees us um, when we deal with the mooring registrations, renewals, um, inspections, mm -hmm. anything related with their, their personal moorings. How many moorings do, do we have uh, in Portsmouth? Approximately 1,000. Hmm. Seems like a lot. Are they all full? <laughs> well, they're all individually owned um, for individual ah. use on the residential. We have several different categories. There's residential, um, and then the waterfront property owners can have a guest mooring, basically use it as a driveway for any visitors. Um, we have commercial moorings. Uh, Pirate Cove Marina has several of those um, to use as a commercial purpose to rent them out. We have uh, residential and non-residential. How, how do you determine where a mooring can go and what conditions have to prevail? I notice we, we do have an, uh, an, um, a management plan and an ordinance uh, governing um, your activities. So in, in this, there must be a discussion as to where, which piece of ground can a mooring go on and, and what kind of mooring it, it can be. That's determined basically by the individual who has legal access to the area in which they want the mooring. Okay. Um, also by the, the size of the boat, um, what, what the draft of the boat would be, the weight of the boat, you know, the size of the boat, um, where we could fit it in. I know I, I live uh, off of Macquarie Point and uh, we've just got several moorings down there. And every year it seems like there may be an, an additional one added. Is there any limits to how many can, can be put in a, in a single area? Let's the just take Macquarie Point because I'm familiar with that. Uh, how many more moorings could we have down there? No more. <laughs> the, no more. St the state has closed uh, Macquarie's and Sandy Point to any um, new moorings. Okay. Yeah. So when you say the state, does that mean yeah. the chief, that the yeah. DEM has, is, has yeah. a to expound part on to that play? in our harbor management plan, which is being redone at this time, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully that will be coming out this year. Uh, we're just waiting on the state to come back and with some testing that they have done. What it is is that the state has governed where you're going to have your mooring fields. And it has to, a lot to do with pristine waters, to keep the waters clean, to keep them free from, from hazards and so forth. Okay. So therefore, what Steve has to do is put these moorings in these specific locations and make sure then he has to abide by all the other standards that go along with it, the size of the boat, the tackle, uh, and so forth, so that these boats aren't banging into each other. And this is the problem uh, Steve is facing now, is trying to get everybody who wants to be in these areas in there. And uh, before, I mean, I was a resident, grew up in this town all my life. Uh, there was never any such thing as any governance of yeah. moorings, and everybody could have a boat in a mooring wherever they wanted to. And it's, it can't be like that any longer. You know, it has to be organized, and there has to be a system to be able to, to properly oversee them. Understood. The, the other things that you do, Steve, um, you handle complaints of my mooring has been tampered with, and, and you oh, every, every now and again you jump aboard and you drive down there and say, "Okay, there's a lot um, in Potter's Cove." So, what's Cove. the the, the law, law enforcement side of it? Is it so, if, if there is a if there is, you know, somebody's moaning and groaning, you you're it, right? The, that's it. <laughs> okay, you're saying about Pirates Cove, something happened. Um, Potter's Cove is Potter's one of those Cove, areas yeah. where you know somebody's unauth you know unauthorized. Um, mm -hmm 
on somebody else's mooring. We get a lot of complaints of that out there. And it is, it is kind of dangerous with, you don't know what the tackle is underneath. So if you come in with a 47 foot boat, but the mooring's only you know, geared for a 20 foot boat, you know, you could drag it and you know, actually interfere yep. with the other yep. boats in the area, so. Gotcha. Um, how much does it cost to get a, to get a mooring if you're a resident? Residentials, uh, they pay five dollar, uh, a $5 service charge to the online mooring company that manages the electronic data. Okay, so, but you have to buy your own equipment. Yes. And, and, but somebody else is going to put that in, into the ground for you? The, the in the spot that you say is correct? Yes. Generally what happens is the person will apply for a mooring. Mm -hmm. um, when it gets approved, I'll meet with um, the vendor of that person's choice. So the, the mooring holder will contact the vendor um, authorized by the town and you know, we'll go out there together and find the, the area that you know, the, the mooring holder would like and then you know, where we could actually fit okay. them in and then the licensed mooring vendor will put, put the mooring in. How much of your day do you actually spend on the water? A little bit. I try to, uh, <laughs> try to make sure I'm out on the water on the weekends and you know, leading up to the weekends and holidays, um, but a lot, of, a lot of office time in the uh, midweek. Okay, but w while you are assigned as harbor master, the chief can't say, excuse me, Steve, but you know, I've got other duties that I wish you would take care of, sir. Would you go and do those things? There'd be no argument if he did. <laughs> <laughs> Steve spends a lot, like he says, a, a lot of administrative work with dealing with the yeah. moorings and dealing with all the follow-up and so forth. But he also has to go out and inspect all those moorings. Yeah. And he goes out during the week and he, he, he divvies up his day between staying in the office and getting out on the water and also checking to make sure that and this is why this, this program that we have now has come full circle. Uh, he's able to be able to be on the boat, be able to pull up the, all of those resources out of this computer system and be able to hopefully most people abide and give us a picture of the boat or we'll have all the registration data. So Steve can go and look and say, yes, that boat belongs on that mooring. And then he can go and check all the mooring fields, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it, it's come a long way from the old card index or the old having to bring out a binder such as this and being able to go through it. Yeah. So um, the online mooring system in, uh, that we put into play a couple of years ago has uh, helped uh, the Harbor Master program immensely. Super. Um, enforcement, law enforcement on the water. Um, boating safety laws. Talk about that. Uh, the big, biggest problem would most likely be uh, BWI boating while intoxicated. Um, there's not a lot of education on that, and it, people are kind of in the, uh, the, the mode of just out there having fun, and they don't realize exactly what they're yeah. doing. Yeah, we've so had some serious incidents over the years, uh, and um, I'm sure Steve can elaborate on this. Boating, drinking on the water, everybody just looks at it as a recreational, and it's not like being in a vehicle and having those responsibilities. But sometimes the responsibilities of being in the boat is 10 times higher than it almost is sometimes in a car because when you're in the water it's not stepping out on the pavement you do not have control of a boat and you don't have the navigational aids that you do street lighting and lights and so forth and lines on the road uh, we've had some serious tragedies over the years uh, we had one just two years ago off of Prudence Island someone boating at night uh, it's well, dark ran, it, yeah. ran, a gr ran aground yeah. um, and this is why the enforcement effort has to be out there and especially during uh, our Saturdays and Sundays during the day when there's many boats going in all sure. different directions and so forth and that's what Steve's out there for to be able to see those violators to see that someone's in you know in no wake zones that they're going too fast or if they're in in certain areas where they're jet skiing and they're getting too close to boats uh, water skiing and so forth right. I mean he has to be able to try to keep people safe and a lot of times when you stop them and you're dealing with them, you're going to yeah. find out that they've, they're either partaking, drinking alcoholic beverages and so forth. I've been so. down at Bacori when uh, some of the jet skis were, were put in the water and they, they go fast. Mm. They look like they're really, uh, I don't know, chancy, I suppose. If anything happens at all, I mean, that Well, they're a lot of fun, but they've also come down with, with, uh, with legislation now. Is there speed limit on the... Well, the jet skis, coming? they have to have a specialized... Um, boating safety course in Rhode Island oh, to actually operate right. one. Yeah. So we do, that's one of the things we check the jet skis for a lot is to make sure that they have that boating safety. Yeah. Are you in communication uh, when you're, whenever you're on the water with the Coast Guard? Is it the only other law enforcing uh, 
uh, agencies that would be in the Bay would be Coast Guard, right? Coast Guard, um, DEM, and then we also have contact with um, Newport, uh, Tiverton, and Bristol as well. Through We have the, the Marine Radio, we have the regular police radio, um, we're in communication with them. Because DEM, DEM doesn't have um, well, D -E -M. legal can't arrest a boater. Oh yes, DEM. DEM has full law enforcement authority. Oh, I didn't know that. And they're the, actually, they're the primary law enforcement uh, for the state of Rhode Island, just as state police has full jurisdiction, yep. DEM has full jurisdiction over all waters in Rhode Island. Yeah, including the fresh. I know they're but uh, the problem we run into is that DEM is so undermanned. Sometimes they only have possibly two yeah. marine, un marine units out for the whole on state. a weekend for a whole state. And that's not only oh. the salt yeah. water, that's also fresh water. Yeah. So therefore, what they're doing is they're going and they're uh, uh, relying on where their problem area is for that given weekend. If there's a certain event going on, it could be inland or offshore. So uh, Steve's primary backup a lot is, is Coast Guard, yeah. and Coast Guard's coming out of one or two places, either Bristol or Newport, and their primary responsibility, obviously, is mostly is, most of the time is off of Newport. Right. I was briefly um, in the lobster business, got a commercial license, and was playing with it, but Never had too many pots, but the Coast Guard occasionally would come by and yeah. let me see your, you know. And they don't have a lot of units either. No, I mean, no. uh, they have their specialized units that are going yeah. and checking out their large boats that are off of Newport in the deeper waters. Mm -hmm. And then they might only have one unit uh, that's available for in harbor. So therefore, if they know that Portsmouth's taking care of their own jurisdiction, and Steve is out there, they'll concentrate mainly on the Newport waters where the traffic is probably heavier. In, in terms of the law enforcement side of it, um, uh, besides the state laws, which are numerous, um, we've, uh, we have our own uh, code, and it, it provides for fines for violating a, a multitude of, of sins at, on the water. Um, I was just curious, how often are we actually fining anyone? Uh, we try to do uh, a lot of um, education, yeah. but at, at some point, you know, you can only educate so far, and yeah. then we do, we do issue fines. I, I was looking at the budget for, uh, for the Harbor Master in our, our town budget, and I, I didn't see where there was an income source for fines. That would be under another part of the budget. Oh, That's okay. only operational uh, underneath there, but you would have to go to the um, Part of the budget so the that will show revenue, yeah, police revenue, and that'll show yeah, where our there fines are. are. There are fines. Yeah, and again, Steve pointed on it. We really try, and it's our thought process. We're not out there to be finding people. We're out there to educate. We're out there to make sure that people are brought up to date. Do you have your life preservers on? Do you, are your children properly, you know, harnessed in as, w with life preservers? Do you have all the other uh, safety equipment that goes along with the boat? And where Steve uses good judgment all the time. And that is, there comes a point in time where he sees someone who just, either from prior contact or the contact that day during that stop, yeah. uh, he'll see that this person really doesn't care That's about he why called, he came out he of the water. And says, Chief. Well, no, Steve <laughs> has, he has the authority yeah. and basically he carries that out yeah. very well during the day. But he actually yeah. tries to get with people even before they're leaving. So he tries to yeah. get to a lot of the boat launch ramp sites and, c and conduct inspections there. It's the worst thing is in the middle of their voyage, terminate their voyage and send them back to the shore. But if they don't have their life life jackets and their yeah. the flares and you know sound producing devices, um, we try to we try to meet at some of the launch points and you know okay. advise them before they go out that they need the stuff so they can still have access to go to the store and pick something up. Good. What happens when you go on vacation or don't get, you don't get a vacation in your job? He doesn't get a lot of <laughs> vacation during the summer, and that's that's the uh, that's kind of rough. But that's the responsibility Steve's yeah. taken on. Uh, okay. along with other harbor masters in the past. They know that during this time period, and especially during our busy weekends, yeah. when we start getting towards the end of June, July, and August, there's not, there's not time to take off. Understood. You, you must have a couple of other people who have got some schooling background in, uh, in, in water safety issues too, don't you, on the force? We have, yeah. Go ahead. In fact, we've had other people go through some of the training courses, yep. and you know they do come out on the boat with me. I mean, it, when we do any enforcement, it's, it's two officers on the boat. So oh, there's okay. People that, do have that's training. Makes great sense. Well, it's not like being in a vehicle where yeah. the other car can come from another yeah. place and get there and yeah. probably get there safely. Um, yeah. Boating, wa water safety is not like being on the land. Um, 
I always use this analogy with him, and sometimes it, it, I'm like a mother um, saying, hey, you're going out today, do you have someone with you? Because the one thing um, I never want to have to do is go to his wife's house and knock mm -hmm. on the door and say, we can't find Steve. Understood. Yeah, I spent a long time in the military and the Navy, and uh, it's you, not a fun. You understand it's the not importance. A, it's fun, it's fun safety event. on the water, and, it's, and having a buddy huge, system is sure. huge. Um, you occasionally get to assist in some of the larger water events uh, in town. Can you go back in time? And uh, we usually assist with the uh, Coast Guard at the uh, air show okay. every year, um, just with the the no, the no pass zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, this year, I think we'll be assisting with the uh, tall ships. Um, yeah, I was going to ask that, that, that. This is tall ships big. Yeah, a lot of activity on the water. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So we'll have that, and uh, the America's Cup races will be here this year. Yeah, um, there's a lot of sailing events that that'll go through. You know, mostly coming out of Newport, but they'll come up through um, Middletown and then into Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. Bristol's Fourth of July fireworks. Also, yeah. that every requires year. our help. Yeah, every year. Mm. Yeah, I can see where you had a very you have a very busy summer. I it, 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 there's a lot of events, and there's also uh, some law enforcement things that uh, a lot of people don't know, and that is if uh, large tankers or anybody's coming into ports and jurisdictional mm -hmm. waters and they're going to tie up, we have to usually work with other federal agencies that have to go out there and do inspections on the boat. So we, they use us as a backup. Ah. Um, the um, customs issues occurs to me. We have this tremendous issue with drugs in, our, in, in the country everywhere. and then We are a water state. Do you get training in, 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 in the drug enforcement side of life? Uh, not not so you, much. Yeah, if you, if common sense dicts, uh, tells you that mm, this, this looks like a drug issue, then you go elsewhere for and we have assets. we have phone numbers for you know every yeah. federal agency and every other agency that we would need. It's like other other investigations, and that is, those investigations are sought through based upon information. Um, Steve's on the lookout, <coughs> just as our normal patrol officers are on the lookout for any suspicious activity on the water. Mm. But uh, more so now, we're working much closer with federal agencies in identifying areas or identifying suspicious activity. What, uh, I want to go back to something here uh, on, the, on the online mooring uh, registration side of life. When did we start that and, and exactly how does a, um, a taxpayer or a citizen of the town work that system? It was before, was that about four years ago? Four years ago, yeah. Before my time, but um, okay. what, what you do is from anywhere at any time, it's open 24 hours a day, is you can go online to uh, onlinemooring.com and you enter the Portsmouth, Rhode Island Harbor and you just you file your application, you provide your personal information, um, email address, your boat information and you submit it. Does that uh, website tell you how many moorings are available for you to potentially no, choose it, from? No, it'll allow you to apply to the different areas in town. Okay. Um, doesn't tell you any availability but I'll get the request for the mooring and I'll, I'll put it on a wait list for that location. And you just remain on the wait list until a position opens up, okay. and then you'd be notified. Do you, do you check insurance? I, I thought I heard the discussion on that recently. And insurance is, Are you re required to have insurance to get a mooring? It's not mandatory, but there, there is a, a field there. If you want to put your boat information, uh, your boat insurance information on there, um, you can add that to your application. You can also add a photo of your boat. Um, so if you do report it as lost, missing, sunk, uh, we have a photo of the boat. We're not just looking for, you know, 90% mm -hmm. of the boats are white. I have a white, yep. you know, sea ray. Yep. We yep. have an actual photo yep. of the boat. And um, the insurance information is handy to have on there. Most people leave the insurance information on their boat. And if the boat is missing, they don't have the insurance information. It just facilitates making your claims easier. So you would advise keeping your insurance information in your wallet <laughs> rather than in the, the boat's glove box? Um, if if the uh, th this automated system is is something that is used by several communities, so it's just not not Portsmouth. It's I believe there's about twelve or fourteen communities on the East Coast that use it, and I, you know, I have access to it on the boat, so I can actually I can call up any of the information on the boat. Um, I can contact any of the mooring holders by the information they provide on the boat. And um, 
owners of moorings can can get what other kind of information from this website? Well, it's a collaborative website, so I provide information to the to, to your account. Oh, so it's so you stay. It's it's up to date information. It's it's immediate as as okay. the best information you can about provide. Weather? It's real time. Yeah, um, I, I want to go fishing and. Uh, well, what they do is you would provide all your information. Um, the mooring vendors ap apply the information of you know what your ground tackle is, uh, what what size anchor you have, yeah. uh, the chain, the water depth. So we can actually plot with the computer system the, the sway of the boat okay. and the scope of the, the mooring. Um, I can also send out, you know, to these 1,000 people, I can send out emergency uh, message notifications in, you know, less than two minutes. Oh, okay. So probably not the fishing information, but Sounds we can like send out hurricane red. warnings. <laughs> Basically for the water, yeah. it, it allows Steve to be able to say we're preparing for the hurricane. Steve will come out with several different emails at the different okay. times, positions, depending on where the storm's coming from and reminding them this is you have to get this done by such yeah. and such in times and it, go, it goes on and on hurricane uh, abigail or hurricane zeus mm -hmm. is coming our way you mm -hmm. what do you do well, we would get with ema and they would provide us with you know what information they have and then i would just i said it's very simple to compose one email that would go out to the, the 1000 people but uh, unfortunately some people don't update their information so you know it, it, we don't know if they get it um it would do be nice have, if everyone yeah. continuously updated their information. Do we have in our code, um, any uh, our ordinance, uh, any absolute guidance that says that if uh, if there's a, a Category 4 hurricane coming your way, you will take your boat off that mooring and move it? We can't force people unless we ca it comes down to a specific point where a boat is in a specific position that we know is going to cause a hazard or it's causing okay. a hazard to traffic trying to get these boats off the water. Um, that's about the only time that we can really use our enforcement powers for so uh, to further that. But we cannot force people to take their boats out of the water. We can't force marinas to to pull every single boat. I mean, and mm -hmm. if you look at it that way, it, it's kind of impossible. So what Steve does is from the onset of when we start our emergency management plan, and a few years ago we came up with specific language and specific SOPs, standard operating procedures, Steve to know what to do at given points in time upon prior to the storm. Pre-inspection and then when the storm gets too bad obviously we can't have them and we actually pull our boats to make sure that we then can respond to the aftermath. Mm. And then that's the aftermath is when Steve gets out there and starts identifying the damage, starts identifying boats that have broken loose, contacting the owners, telling them that we found yes. your boat, it might be a mile away from where you had it moored. So, uh, do you have more than one boat? We have the the one boat, but the fire department also has a boat, so we oh, we're constantly. Oh, you said boats, and I I picked up on the plurality. Of yeah, boats. both <laughs> us and the fire department, and what we do is we try to keep those boats together because, uh, and this gets into another reason of why we uh, the police are uh, uh, have this primary duty of harbor master, and that is obviously uh, Prudence Island and Hog Island are a part of Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a major part of our jurisdiction we have to be able to get over there to assist Absolutely. the public safety officer and we're also responsible for getting over there and investigating all crimes so um, we have to respond there immediately so having just one boat with the fire department uh, the police department's always had a boat uh, going back why to did, our early yeah, years why did the fire department get a boat the, well for obviously for their medical emergency that's how they so transport it's medical, people it's medical so okay. we try to keep those boats together and so what happens is if the fire department has to respond to a medical emergency and all of a sudden that key doesn't turn or the engine, you know, cuts out, they can just jump over onto our boat and vice sure. versa if we have emergencies. I mean, there's always maintenance in the summer where, you know, one yeah, boat some, is, some is, is pulled for down, maintenance. Yeah. And there's Are always they both about the same size? Uh, like a four-foot difference. Oh, it's yeah. pretty much the same boat. I'm ashamed to say I've actually never eyeballed. I'm going to now, now. Now I'm curious. The boat, we boat, the, the boat we have now, we got through federal grant and used uh, mainly, I, th I believe it's more than 90% of the funds that, that, was, uh, That's that was given out. Good. So at that time we made the decision that we really yeah. did need a new boat, but w when we went out and we purchased a new boat, we put a lot of thought effort into it. Yeah. We wanted to model it so that we could uh, respond to emergency situations. We could get a gurney on that boat, and that's huge. Oh, when that's you're coming huge. off that's Sandpoint huge. Dock and there, yeah. you, you've had a heart attack and you're in a gurney, I mean, and you ha you're all hooked up to everything. You have to have the room Been in the there, boat to secure it. <laughs> you have to have the room in the boat to secure you Absolutely. and be able to keep that gear on you to keep you alive so we can get you yeah, back to the mainland. I think those of us who live on the mainland part of this island don't, don't appreciate I mean, 
what our Portsmouth responsibility is out with all these various islands. You have people living without bridges all over the place. Without yeah. bridges, yeah. You know, all of a sudden your life becomes different. I know it. We've got about three minutes more in, in our program today. I want to ask Steve about the uh, your connection with the Harbor Commission. We have uh, a group of people who are, um, are, are represent our Harbor Commission, and they are um, interested in what's happening here. What's your interface? Do you sit on the board with them? I sit on the board with them. Um, we attend all the meetings and you try to advise them you know, what, what the town's interests are. And they, they, do, they do a majority of the work. <laughs> okay. So they're, they're the ones that are, that are in, in the process of helping to revise the uh, Harbor and Coastal Waters Management Plan. Now. Yes. Yeah. They're probably also the ordinance. That'll be their second step. to be there. Good. So we should be seeing something from them soon? Is that I hope what so. you're here? We're hoping. Okay. I got a briefing from Mr. Irwin the other day. We sat yeah. down and went over a few uh, points of interest, especially from the police side. And Steve uh, has brought this up at different Harbor Master meetings, uh, or the, the Harbor Commission meetings. And he tries to bring back all the information he gets from the other Harbor Masters and from the other problems in other communities so that when this plan is being drawn up, it's not only from the demands from the state that we run our program a certain way and that we have to abide by certain yeah. things, but we want to learn from what other communities are doing, what's working and what's not working. Is there an annual meeting of, uh, of Harbor Masters or equivalents? There, uh, there's a Harbor Master Association. Oh, there is, and okay. And they meet regularly. Right. Yeah, I know the Harbor Master in Newport must be a very busy person. I mean, they yeah. have, you know, you look down there in February and it's an empty, empty plane. Yeah. And then you, you well, when come June, June, it's mass and chaos. And, and, and I don't know how people get their boats through all of those. Oh, you know. Been down there a couple of times and it's tight. <laughs> yeah. Especially yeah, when they bring in the large cruise ships and, yeah, you know, they have them. Which probably explains why the roads are so awfully busy in the, in the summertime. Well, um, is there, we just got a, about a minute to go. Um, is there something that, that, that we haven't talked about that you think that people should hear? Uh, from the, the contact information. A lot of people um, th think that if they call the 6430137, which is the Harbor Master Extension, um, they leave messages there. And they leave messages there with things that are kind of important mm -hmm. and should be handled that time. Um, obviously, any emergencies, they should call 911. Uh, but if it's anything that needs an immediate response, like somebody's on my mooring or, you know, there's some, something that's not they 911. Call, call yeah, the police. 683-0300 yeah, and, you know, just explain their problem to them so that th there is a little bad blood when, you know, I call back, you know, after my two days off and yeah, yeah. something should have been handled, you know, in the middle of the night. <laughs> the Harbor Master Understood. number that's listed on our website is mainly for administrative purposes. Yeah. All other purposes, if it's not quite a 911 emergency, then use the 0300. Yeah. Uh, the desk officer or the officer in charge can always get in touch with Steve or be able to try to find out how to handle the situation. Super, super. Well, listen, thank you very much for coming and sharing a little bit of, uh, of your lives here. Um, the notion um, of, of this whole programming is that uh, if, if we all, uh, that is everybody in the town, gets the chance to uh, see and hear the people who are taking care of them, we're going to be the better for it. So thank you all for watching uh, Portsmouth this week, and we look forward to seeing you in the next program. In 2012, Rhode Island's new voter ID law will go into effect. You're going to need to bring with you identification when you go to the polls to vote. A Rhode Island driver's license, a Rhode Island ID, a student ID, or any state or federal government issued identification card with a photo on it is sufficient to vote. If you do not possess one of those forms of identification, we will provide one to you for free for voting purposes only. For details, please call us at 222-2340.